You know, the, the fundamental of the idea that the adult brain is set in stone is, you know, the common saying that you can't teach an old dog new tricks, but in fact you can. The adult brain, again, you know, through ripe old age in their 40s, 50s, 60s, even beyond, can change its structure and function in a significant way. Everyone I know uh, who gets, who's getting older, uh, forgets things, makes jokes about having senior moments, but I think deep down inside, everyone is kind of concerned that they're headed down this path of, of, uh, of, of losing their cognitive abilities. Um, I think it's very clear that everyone doesn't lose their cognitive ability. There's two factors that contribute here. One is genetics. Our family history is an important component. And the other is our environment. And those relationship between genes and environment dictate the degree of gray matter loss. And so you can influence one and not the other. You can influence your environment. You can stay active. You can exercise your brain just as you can exercise your body. These are enormously helpful in slowing down that degenerative loss that's part of normal aging. With recent advances in technology and research, several key things that we thought were absolutely true about the brain are being challenged and proven wrong. For many years, conventional wisdom in the neurosciences has been that the brain is fixed in its physical and anatomical organization after an early stage of development that ends in childhood. But a growing crescendo of scientific studies now shows that the brain is not hardwired in childhood and we are not doomed by our DNA. On the contrary, our brain is pliable, plastic, and changeable throughout our lifespan, regardless of our age or genetics. Can we train the brain in ways that correct or compensate for injuries or impairments? Can we change our brain in ways that contribute to its rejuvenation as we grow older? To what extent can the brain heal itself with our guidance? Join us on a journey across the frontiers of neuroscience, psychology, and neurology as we explore the immense power of the Brain Fitness Program. Neuroplasticity is the key to brain fitness. The brain is malleable. Throughout our entire lives, it can be physically and functionally changed, even improved upon by how we use it. Brain plasticity has been called one of the most extraordinary discoveries of the 20th century. It's true throughout evolution that the plasticity of the brain, the ability of the brain to adapt to our environment, continues through life. That adaption is an opportunity for us to continue to stimulate our brain and slow down the degenerative progression during aging. But brain plasticity does not function in the same way throughout our entire lives. In infancy and early childhood, the brain goes through its critical period, a time of riotous plastic brain change. This is a special period of time when plasticity is taking place on a large scale. Well, a critical period in brain development is, is a setup period. That's when the brain basically is initially organizing its activities, it's, it's doing the initial sorting. It's basically setting up the machinery in the initial form that allows us to take off in learning. But in this early period, the brain actually can't control learning itself. And a marvelous thing happens across the early life of the child. Across this period, the brain actually learns itself how to establish control. When our bodies sense something, a noise, a feeling, a sight, our sensory organs, such as our eyes and ears, translate it into electrical impulses that the brain can understand. These impulses travel through the brain by passing from one neuron, a brain cell, to another, like in a relay race. How the impulses travel, the neural route they follow, the speed with which they're passed along, and so on, can change. As a skill is developed, these neural routes become more pronounced, deeper, faster, and easier for the brain to follow, and they involve more neurons. At birth, the brain has a few inherited neural pathways. Early in life, all of these main trunk lines are formed. It's a little bit like thinking of a map of the U.S. where you're born with the superhighways or the big roads. And then gradually, as you develop skills and abilities, you're filling in 
the little local roads and the streets and ultimately the driveways and the little lanes and byways and riding paths and walking trails. Ultimately, if you wanted to figure out how to get to grandma's house, you got to have all of that detail. So the brain basically starts by, of course, creating a basic way in which it ships information around on the big highways. And what it's doing is refining its pathways so that ultimately it can get to more and more specific control, more and more specific behavior, more and more specific collaboration in its control. We think of using a spoon as a relatively trivial thing. It seems simple. We've all mastered it. But actually, it's not so simple. And actually, as a consequence of learning to use it, massive changes in the brain have to occur. I have this lever, this little lever. It has a little scoop on one end. And I have to learn how to control it, hold it, first of all. And now I have to learn how to manipulate it in a way that could keep it upright. And I have to load it with, with food. Well, that food could be gloppy, could be watery. It could be heavy, it could be light. And if you think of the massive nature of changes that underlie a skill like that, think of all of the changes that have to occur when you, when you master a repertoire of skills, like movements in general, or your ability to produce speech, or your ability to understand it, or your ability to type. And the brain continually changes as we learn, as we experience new things that we will remember. The brain revises itself. As we learn any new skill or ability, the brain actually specializes. Primary changes during this time occur in the details of the brain's local wiring. The brain also undergoes massive amounts of physical changes in its wiring each time we acquire a new skill or ability. Another important physical dimension of change that happens in early life and that continues throughout life is neurogenesis. It seems that really what happens is you're born with some number of neurons and then you make more and more and more and more until you're at least a year old, maybe a little older. And then after that, your brain starts pruning off, maybe not killing off neurons, but killing off little branches of them um, that go off to form connections with other branches. Those connections are called synapses. And then somewhere in there you stop losing and you just have sort of a static number of neurons. But nobody has quite figured out, there's new evidence that shows that you do make some more, but nobody quite knows what the trigger is to make more neurons, nobody knows how it happens. I think it's a hot topic to say the least in neuroscience because if you could figure that out, you might have the solution to a lot of diseases um, and possibly to some mental capacities, you know, that we wish we had. Neurogenesis simply means the production of new neurons in the brain. We know that that process continues into at least uh, early toddlerhood, but it had been thought that it stopped again around the age of two or three. Um, and the reason was almost, it wasn't based on empirical observation, it was more just sort of backward reasoning. Namely, the brain is a very complicated computer, and surely if you just sort of haphazardly throw new wires into there, that can't do any good. Therefore, the brain cannot be making new wires, new neurons. Well, it turns out that in an experiment done in the late 90s, which was uh, very clever, they took cancer patients who were terminal and who had, of course, given their consent to the experiment, and they labeled their brain neurons with a particular dye that was incorporated only in dividing cells, in other words, only in cells that were making more of themselves. And this is something that, of course, cancer cells do all the time. After the patients passed away, their brains were examined, and it turns out that a number of neurons in the brain had taken up this dye, and that was prima facie evidence that, in fact, new neurons were being born in the brain. And just to underline, these were elderly people. They were in their 50s and 60s and 70s. So even once you are well past the age of Medicare, your brain is still forming new neurons. And then the question is, under what circumstances does it do so, and can you speed it up? And there the answer turns out to be yes. But surprisingly, you speed it up not by doing crossword puzzles till you're you know, cross-eyed, but instead through physical activity. Something as simple as an hour of aerobic exercise five times a week will dial up the rate of production of new neurons in the brain. So there's you know, hope for all of us yet. Studies have also shown that neurogenesis is amplified by certain mental activity. It takes the right kind of mental activity to achieve positive results. Activities with measurable results that increase in difficulty will challenge your brain to grow and stay healthy.
the brain is constantly adapting to new experiences, learning language at about one year, learning other things as they get a little older, learning mathematics, learning a second language, learning how to perform a violin concerto. All of these things have a critical period in the brain. It doesn't mean you can't learn at a different age, but the brain is more susceptible to adapting to this new task at specific ages. There was a time, not too many years ago, when most scientists believed that the ability to physically remodel our brains was limited to the critical period in the earliest years of childhood. Now we know it's not true. We learn all across a lifetime. But from the end of the critical period to the end of life, the brain controls its self-development, its plasticity. During this time, the brain establishes machinery that is specialized to fit into its environment. And most importantly, it can change this machinery. It is capable of rapidly revising it to accomplish this crucial initial specialization. When I was a boy, everyone knew that a child born with a deep cleft palate was in real trouble. We knew that they would never have normal language abilities. We knew that they'd be slow to learn to read. We knew that they would be cognitively impaired. But a surgeon discovered in Europe, discovered 35 years ago maybe of that order, that if you just fix it when the baby's young enough, none of that happens. That wasn't really inherited. So how do you explain that? Well, it turns out that the cleft palate divides the top of the roof of the mouth, and it closes off two tubes that drain fluid from the middle ears. And these babies were hearing everything in their native language. All of their model in their native language was, in a sense, underwater. It was all muffled. So their native language wasn't English, or it wasn't German, or it wasn't Swedish. It was muffled English. It was degraded German. It was lousy, noisy Swedish. So when you provide that baby, when you provide that brain with a clear signal, English or German or Swedish in a sharp and clear form, the normal form, then the brain can organize its representation. It can plastically revise its machinery to specialize for the sounds of its native language. But the brain, with its wondrous ability for change, can also compensate for injury well beyond childhood. It's usually thought that the later you undergo some trauma, the less likely it is for your brain to reorganize in a significant way. But in the case of a number of people in a study who indeed lost their eyesight after the age of 14, their brain was also able to respond. Usually what happens is that the visual cortex no longer receives signals from the eyes, again, whether that's from birth or later on. And the visual cortex takes up about a third of the brain. So that's an awful lot of the brain to have nothing to do. So it seems to recognize that no signals from the usual sources are coming. And the visual cortex, therefore, gets a new gig. Typically, it becomes sensitive to sensations arriving from the fingers. It becomes able to process signals from the fingertips, from sometimes other regions of the body. It sort of turns itself into somatosensory cortex. But in other cases, it becomes auditory cortex. What we see is, you know, just in daily experience, a lot of people have noticed that people who are blind have a more acute sense of hearing. Well, it turns out that the physical basis for that is that their visual cortex, which again is not receiving signals from the eyes, changes careers and it begins processing sensations from the ears and helps you uh, hear better in the world. While the critical period is important, it is by no means the last chance we have for our brains to improve and adapt. Indeed, improvement and adaptation is a must throughout our lives for preservation of senses, skills, and memory. Learning doesn't just increase our knowledge, it physically alters our brains and our body chemistry. The brain has a strip called the somatosensory cortex, and that takes the feelings that enter uh, into our neurons from your fingertips, but really over, you know, throughout the body, um, every place on your skin. And each region on the skin corresponds to one little spot on the somatosensory cortex. And you have a larger region devoted to the fingertips because they're very sensitive, and hardly any region of the brain is devoted to, you know, let's say your knee because that's not sensitive at all. Well, it turns out that if particular regions, let's say one fingertip more than another, is used more, 
And you can imagine circumstances where that would be true. Reading Braille, for instance, where you have to have very sensitive fingertips and where you spend hours and hours a day feeling something with your fingertips. The region of the brain that processes those sensations expands. So it had one little amount of real estate devoted to it, let's say, when you entered the world. But as you placed greater demands on that region of the brain, it responded. It got larger. So when scientists scan the regions of the brain in blind people who are adept Braille readers, it turns out that those regions are much larger than in you know, the rest of us who do not read Braille. So that was an early indication that, again, something as simple as behavior, the way you live your life, can alter, in this case, the map of the brain. When we are learning, thinking, feeling, we're also strengthening existing synapses and creating new synapses. A synapse is actually the easiest thing probably to explain in the brain. It's just a connection between two neurons. And it's not actually a physical apposition. There's actually a little gap between the two neurons that are connected. And in the space between them is where neurotransmitters float. So you'll have what we'll call a presynaptic neuron, which is going to be the one sending the signal. So an impulse will come down the long axon of that neuron and at the end of it, it will result in the release of this neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter will float across the gap to what we will call the postsynaptic neuron, which will take up that neurotransmitter. And if there's enough of it, then that neuron too will fire. These synapses connect our neurons one to another, strengthening our brains. One important pioneer who contributed to our understanding of synaptic changes in learning was Donald Hebb, a Canadian psychologist who hypothesized how changes in synaptic strengths could account for learning. It's not the repeated exposure that mattered to Hebb. It's the coincident activities that are generated by any important experience. By the Hebb rule, they're co-strengthened because they co-occur. Donald Hebb's great contribution was to come up with the recognition that neurons that fire together wire together. This was the idea that when you have particular patterns of brain activity over and over and over again, let's say uh, you're a little kid and your mother points out the window and says, Robin, you see the bird, you hear the word, you have some sense of what this thing is in front of your eyes. And then forever after, you recognize that that is a Robin. And that's because the connections in your brain have become stronger. The synapses have been created because of repeated exposure to these two things, the sound, the name of the bird, and the image of the bird. Anyway, Hebb's contribution was to make the first baby steps toward showing that our experiences can leave indelible imprints in the brain, in this case, stronger synapses, and that's what underlies all of learning. This firing and wiring is the key to learning and plasticity and brain fitness. Whichever synapses are activated together in each moment of time are mutually strengthened. Well, as I practice any simple skill, Basically, I engage populations of neurons that represent the details of that skill, moment by moment in time. And basically, those neurons are engaged more or less simultaneously in time. And one of the tricks the brain has for specifically strengthening its connections, the connections that contribute to, good, uh, to a good effort, to success, is that it strengthens all of those things that happen in the, together in those little moments of time. So that what is activated together in that little moment of time that really matters for the good fry are co-strengthened. And they actually mutually strengthen one another, as well as are strengthened simultaneously in time, right? And that's the critical to generating a sort of integrated, cooperative action of the brain to drive itself towards higher performance and success. And how do we know all of these things are happening inside of our brains? We know it because we can see it. I can put a living individual into a scanner and watch that person's brain function. I can ask that person to count backwards by threes from 100 and see the circuits that are active while they're doing that. How remarkable is that? It's amazing to me that you can actually see the brain functioning while this person performs a task. That has revolutionized our ability to study the human brain.
And to me, I think that holds the greatest promise for us to understand all the complexities and all the nuances that make us so human. Because you couldn't do that before. And we can actually watch this person in the scanner doing these tasks. That's amazing. Functional MRI is a way of using MRI, but also watching the blood flow in and out of structures. And the kind of functional MRI I like the best, of course, is uh, functional brain imaging. And what happens there is they, they're able to take a picture based on the properties of the blood as it comes in of which areas of the brain are getting more blood at any given time. And that can change. And what scientists are doing is they'll correlate the change with the mental task or the stated emotions or mental state of, the, of a research subject. And then they can see which parts of the brain are more active at the time that the patient is or subject is experiencing an emotional state or thinking about something. These important advances in technology have allowed us to see inside the brain. Scientists have repeatedly documented the remarkable capacity for human brains of all ages to change. With that ability lies extraordinary potential for growth and rejuvenation. But this change is not extraordinary. In fact, it is what our brains were designed to do. These are changes that result from the lives we lead and the experiences we have. These are changes that you can induce by learning to play the piano. They are changes that come about when you think new thoughts. So the ways that the brain can change are really opening a lot of eyes in the part on the part of the neuroscience community. As we age, our brains as our bodies aren't quite what they used to be. Much like working to maintain our figure, we must also work to retain our mental acuity. And if we don't, the brain's reliability, agility, and flexibility gradually decline. Then the ability to execute simple tasks or recall information can become a struggle. The typical 30-year-old has command of the use of about 30,000 words. The typical 80-year-old uses about 10,000. It's a fact of modern life that the mature adult has an almost 50-50 chance of ending life non compass mentis. But with brain plasticity, we can change these odds. We can strengthen our brains well past the critical period and even regain some of what we may have lost. But to understand how the brain can change, we must first understand how it ages. It's not so different from the rest of the body. I used to be a six-foot, 240-pound linebacker. <laughs> no, seriously. We lose muscle mass as we age. It's just the natural order of aging. And in the same way, the brain loses mass as well. Parts of the brain begin to degenerate as part of normal aging. If you look at the brain through an MRI scan, for example, you'll see the widening of the sulci, the valleys uh, between the various ridges on the surface of the brain. These widen and fill up with fluid. It's just representing a loss of tissue. The ventricles, spaces that are filled with fluid in the center of the brain, they get larger. So the amount of tissue, brain tissue, uh, is reduced over time. Everybody has recognized from time immemorial that as we get older, our brains decline a little bit. We don't function as well as we did um, with memory and, and just sort of with quickness of processing. And it used to be thought that this had to do with just a global loss of neurons, but nobody has actually been able to account for enough neuron loss to cause the sometimes dramatic decrease in function that people have as they get older. And it turns out that what the thinking is now is that what it actually is is a loss in synapses, that some synapses just die off, um, the connection is lost from one neuron to another, and a loss of myelin, which is this, I like to think of it as like electrical tape. Uh, it's made by cells called oligodendrocytes and it just insulates the long skinny axon of the neuron uh, and allows each neuron to send its message faster. And if you lose myelin, uh, if you lose a lot of myelin, it can be dramatic and devastating. But if you lose a little bit, it can just sort of subtly damp down your processing <laughs> as happens to a lot of us as we get older. The wrinkles and loss of muscle mass are an obvious sign of aging but the impact upon our brains is even more startling. Moments of memory loss, loss of balance, even difficulty hearing. It all starts with the brain. As we get older, 
the speed with which we think and recall and retrieve things does slow down. And so if you then introduce things that are distractors and intrude your ability to retrieve memories, you can look like you're having a memory problem. So what are some of the things that are distractors? Well, get yourself in a room that's loud, um, with a lot of people talking, um, uh, put a few drinks in you, keep it late at night, um, become anxious. Any of those things um, definitely, in any of us, can intrude into our um, ability to remember things. Imagine you're in a stadium. Imagine everyone in the stadium is clapping at a low random rate and you heard low, dull roar coming out of the stadium. Imagine that 50 or 100 people decide they're going to clap in unison. They're going to cooperate. And maybe with some distinctive rhythm. And what you see is that signal, that rhythm rise out of the crowd against the background of 100,000 sources of noise as a clear signal. In the same way, cooperation of the action of neurons in the brain contributes to, to generating clear signal even in the presence of lots of noise. It is the weakening of that cooperation in an older brain that, that contributes and accounts substantially for why older individuals have trouble struggling operating in noisier environments. Another issue that plagues the elderly is fear of falling. Most people think that falling is an issue related to our physical strength, but it really starts with our brains. When we walk, our brains are very, very actively involved in processing us and orienting us. Older people will often be watching their feet as they're walking down the stairs. And because it's a use it or lose it brain, that may not be the best way to go about things because as you start to rely more on your vision for your balance, you're not using your actual balance system. As we've seen, plasticity can be used for powerful changes or positive plasticity. Sometimes in the older brain, the exact opposite can occur, and we witness the ravages of negative plasticity. If I fall when I'm older, and I realize I couldn't stop myself from falling, I'm really worried about it. So what do I do? The well, first thing I do is I turn my head down. I start watching my feet. That's a very negative step. First thing that's bad is that I've used my organ of balance from the beginning of time in my life in this position and I get pretty good information in this. This is where I'm an expert. Now I'm watching the ground and if somebody bumps me because I'm looking in near vision, the ground sweeps past me like lightning. So as soon as I'm bumped, my eyes tell me I'm moving over and they carry me right to the ground. Actually what I've done is I'm training myself to lose my ability to walk without falling. What I'm saying is you actually learn in lots of ways, inactively, to drive things negatively so that you're less capable, so that you're less versatile, so that you're less agile mentally and physically. Plasticity is a two-way street. It's easy to degrade your brain. Plasticity gives rise to flexible behaviors, but sometimes if it if we use our plasticity in a certain way, it actually gives rise to rigidities. The way to think about this is that the brain's plasticity is like snow on a hill in winter. It's because the snow is pliable, you can take many different paths down that hill. If you enjoy that path down the hill, you'll tend to favor that path on subsequent runs. Each time you go down that same run, you'll develop a track. And if you keep going down that track, it becomes a rut. Now, this is the way brain plasticity functions, actually. If you keep doing something, our very plastic brains can give rise to a rigid behavior. Negative plasticity can sometimes result in mental disorders as well. Jeffrey Schwartz um, is a neuropsychiatrist at UCLA, and he works with patients who have obsessive compulsive disorder. In OCD, of course, you're constantly beset with the idea that something is wrong, that you have left the stove on when you departed the house that morning. He looked at the brain circuitry that underlies this. And basically, there is overactivity in a region of the brain, which has been dubbed, not surprisingly, the worry circuit. So what he did is teach patients to think about their thoughts differently. In other words, when the idea that you had left the stove on, when that thought arose, he taught the patients, tell yourself two things. Tell yourself, one, it's not real. And two, tell yourself, that's only my brain talking. 
that's a neuronal glitch. I don't have to pay attention to it. So he did a study comparing patients who learned this form of sort of thought changing um, and compared them with patients who had received standard medication therapy for OCD. So he found that the activity in the worry circuit quieted down to the same extent in both groups of people. In other words, thinking about your thoughts differently acted back on the worry circuit to quiet it in a therapeutic way with the result that these OCD patients really were able to, to shed their illness. They were no longer beset by these burdensome, compulsive, worrying thoughts to the same extent that the medication did. This was a very early indication that the mind can act back on the brain, that the thoughts you think have a physical, measurable effect on the activity of a particular brain circuit. In this case, mindful attention is believed to transform the mind and free it from the symptoms of disease. In the same way, it can increase the quality of information that we receive through our sensory inputs and can help us refine our thinking and behavior. One of the critical factors that controls change in the brain is attention. So the brain has a way basically of turning a spotlight on, on the things that you are, at, quote, attending to. I'm very accurately recording all the details and I can remember them. I will remember this because I've attended to it and plasticity has been enabled in this circumstance. Change has been enabled in my brain as a function of the enabling impacts of attention. Attention is actually regulating what is allowed to change. I only change things that, I, that I'm aware of, that I'm attentive to, right? And as a function of the focus of my attention. That's why it's so crucial when you're in a learning mode, attention be focused, sharp, serious, ideally, because those are the conditions of relatively strong enabling of change, relatively selective enabling of change that drives positive learning, positive brain change. I like the idea of fame in the brain. Any conscious perception is only conscious because you have recruited a certain number of neurons to be associated with it. And at any given time, that can change. And there's different factors that are going to change what you're conscious of. But attention is one of those things that can make conscious ideas or any idea more famous in your brain, more likely to become conscious. That if you say to yourself, okay, I'm really going to focus on this now, that that's going to heighten the uh, activity of all the surrounding neurons. Of course, you're not always in control of your attention, and there's certain things that you're reflexively going to pay attention to. If there's a very loud bang, you're going to pay attention to that probably just out of some basic instincts more than you might pay attention to your algebra text or whatever you're trying to learn. If you've been in the same job for 20 years, you're not getting into that intensive learning experience that you had to uh, do when you first learned the job or when you were studying uh, vocabulary for a French or Spanish exam. And it's that kind of intensive training that you need to get the modulatory or the regulating mechanisms of plasticity in good shape. Just as when you want to improve your cardiovascular health, you have to push yourself. You have to really push yourself cognitively and pay very, very close attention uh, just to increase uh, your cognitive ability. And reading the paper won't do it. And doing the things that you like, dancing the old dances won't do it. But dancing new dances where you have to strain to learn the steps will do it. Attentional control can be far weaker and far less selective in later life than when we're young. Plasticity is hampered by these attentional losses. To better understand how that affects us as we age, we need to investigate modulatory neurotransmitters. These are small chemical molecules whose release results in turning on the plasticity switches in our brain. These same neuromodulators are contributing very positively to your sense of well-being. Dopamine is contributing to how positive, how pleasurable, how fun life is. Noradrenaline in its release is contributing to how alert, how bright you feel. It's also contributing to uh, signals of alarm or danger or trouble when they appear. And those are important. It's important that you have those nuances in the control or regulation of your behavior and your feelings. Acetylcholine is contributing to your feelings of, of brightness, alertment, engagement, how engaged you are in behavior and so forth. So as this machinery slowly dies off, guess what else is happening? The person that you are, the bright, energetic, enthusiastic, with it person that you are is slowly fading.
So it's very crucial that you keep this machinery in tip-top shape. And it's very crucial if you've let it decline, or a really good idea if you let it decline, that you buck it up again and improve its functionality. Because you won't just get the bonus of better learning and stronger vivification of memory from it. You'll get the addition of having a brighter life, more cheerful life, joyful life, hypothetically, alerter, more engaged life. When tasks are too easy or routine, things we do every day, for instance, our actions don't release those neurotransmitters. Instead of learning, we're using the skills that the brain already knows. This turns the plasticity switch to off, and nothing changes in the brain. Our ability to affect change in our brain is also affected by our drive and willingness to leave our comfort zones. When we're young, it's all about the acquisition of ability. At some point, we cross a transition in which we're mostly acquiring ability to a point in which we're mostly using abilities that we've already acquired. We become users. And now, most of our time is spent using the skills and abilities that we've mastered in our younger life. Now we're no longer spending most of our day acquiring ability or information. We're relying on, we're churning it up from our past. We're relying on all of those things we know about. We want to do the things that we've mastered. Don't tell me I, I should learn a new game. I'm good at golf. We all get, quote, set in our ways. And what this is really reflecting is, is that we're seeking the comfort of the things we've already mastered that we're good at. We think of learning in terms of content. We don't think of improving our brains and how they could acquire that content. Real learning is a continually elaborating what is us and our abilities. It make, makes us more effectively operating in the world in controlling ourselves, our brains and our bodies in life. Learning new tasks and challenging our minds in a very focused way is the best way to slow mental aging. Acquiring new skills is important, but without remembering, the brain cannot harness its true power. One of the keys to our memory lies in our hippocampus. So there's this guy who was one day found wandering along the side of the highway, and the uh, state policeman who picked him up asked him his name and he gave his name and said that he was stationed at a nearby army base and gave his age as 22 years old. And I don't know if the officer realized it or not, but he must have appeared at least a decade older than that because he was. And he didn't live at this army base anymore, although he had. He had been stationed there when he was about 22. And it turns out that he had just lost all of the memories of the last 11 years, gone. He didn't remember that he had had two kids. He, he thought that his wife was still just about to have the first kid. And it turned out that he had a cyst that was pressing on the uh, conduit between the hippocampus and the rest of his brain. Once that cyst was drained, all of his memories returned. What this is is a, a really rare living example of the the most interesting thing I think about the hippocampus and memory, which is that for memories that are what they call declarative, meaning memories that you can talk about, what I had for breakfast or where I was born, these memories are initially brought into the hippocampus and it is only after time that they are sent out to the cortex. Brain change, harnessing the potential for positive plasticity. These are the hallmarks for maximizing the level of your own brain fitness. A clear example of this can be seen in the real world applications of plasticity as seen in the rehabilitation therapy of patients who suffered a stroke or traumatic brain injury. The phone rang around 6.20 and I looked at caller ID and it and I knew, you know. So I just said, John's my son, is he okay? And he said, ma'am, there's been an incident. Well, I remember running up to a Humvee to start unloading it, and uh, all I remember was falling down, and I thought I smacked my head on my rifle. When I got up, I wiped my uh, forehead, and there was a little bit of blood on it. And I guess the motor round had exploded about five feet away from me. 
and shrapnel had gone straight through my helmet and then straight through my head. The affected arm had a greater deficit at shoulder and elbow than the fingers, but even the fingers, he had no dexterity, the thumb was extremely weak, and there was almost nothing that he could do with the arm. Edward Taub's therapy that he pioneered at the University of Alabama at Birmingham was developed in the service of rehabilitation of brain damage. Whether that damage was caused by a traumatic brain injury, like that experienced by John Barnes, or by something like a stroke. If you constrain the good arm so that the patient doesn't rely on it, but instead through intensive therapy, which is about eight hours a day, five days a week for a couple of months or more, but just encourage and coax and urge that patient to use the seemingly paralyzed arm, which sounds paradoxical, but they can. They can make tiny little movements, and if they build on those, they can regain function. Dr. Taub's therapy had similar success with another traumatic brain injury patient, Army veteran Christopher Lynch. It's marvelous working with John and with Chris because they have the discipline of military training. So they approach this as if this were boot camp or basic training. Undertaking the Taub therapy requires commitment on the part of the patient and the caregiver. Recovery does not stop after you get out of the therapy sessions, out of the classroom therapy. You go home and you keep doing it, you keep doing it, you keep motivation. It's the motivation that you need to have. I was a little skeptical. I saw simplistic, repetitious movement in the therapy that he was doing. He had a mitt on his hand. It all made common sense to me. But I wasn't too sure. I, I still had my questions. You know, is this really going to work? Three days into the therapy, Chris woke up in the morning and had had a dream. That was the first surprising thing that I, I felt meant something. He hadn't dreamt in two years. My brain had felt like the, the brain was firing. It's like the more you the more you work the brain, the more the more it, it it heals itself in a way. On the way home from therapy, um, we were between here and Montgomery, Alabama, and Chris automatically reached up and pushed the button on the radio with his left hand, and it was um, it blew me away. I looked at him and I was just extremely surprised by it. And he looked at me and said, what? So I knew he didn't actually have to think about pushing the button on the radio. It happened. The main theme of CI therapy, you either use it or you lose it. And if you've already lost it, that's okay, you can get it back if you keep trying. As we have witnessed, our brain is capable of amazing change. But in order for change to occur, the situation and the stimuli must be optimal. Learning is occurring all of the time, whether we're aware of it or not. But what are the guiding principles that govern the plastic remodeling of the adult brain? What actually changes in the brain as you learn and remember? In order to drive positive change in the brain, there are seven tenets of plasticity that we must utilize. Tenet number one, change can occur only when the brain is in the mood. Attention becomes an, a critical enabling factor in what you learn about, in what, where change is allowed. Change is primarily comes from the things that you pay attention to. If we're on the ball, if we're on fire, if we're really paying attention, if we're really engaged, that is contributing to changes in our brain that are going to facilitate change. Brain plasticity is enabled by behavioral circumstances. If I'm alert, on the ball, ready for action, the brain releases those chemical neurotransmitters that enable brain change. You can think of them as on-off switches. When I'm in a learning or attentive, engaged mode, 
The brain is on and ready to change. If I'm disengaged or inattentive or paying attention to something else or performing an action that requires no real effort to succeed on my part, my switches are turned off. Tenet number two. Change strengthens connection between neurons engaged at the same time. Sometimes the brain knows immediately that it has a good outcome. You know, like I, I put the quarter in the slot machine and the bells go off and there's $250 of worth of quarters coming down. Right? I mean, that's, sometimes it knows immediately. It doesn't have to guess, right? Other times it creates a model, commonly a model of some perfection in an activity. So if I'm trying to bounce a ball on a paddle, for instance, of course, the first time I do it, I might get one bounce, and then there goes the ball. But I have this model, and I'm weighing the value of tries. If I do it three times, wow, you know, I'm improving. The brain says, good, save that one. Now, what is it saving? It's saving that combination of connections that contribute to the good try, and it's making them a little stronger. So you can say, in any behavior like this, the magic is selectivity. It's changing the connections selectively that contribute to the good try. Tenet number three, neurons that fire together, wire together. Things that we see or hear usually have many complexly related parts. The brain strengthens its connections between the things that reliably occur in serial time and makes predictions. By saving these connections, it has a capacity for continually making predictions about what goes with what and what comes next. They contribute greatly to the brain's reliable and stable actions. I mean, the brain is a highly integrated organ, that there are components of activity that are occurring throughout the brain in all of our behaviors. It's relating it to past experiences. It's predicting what may happen in the future. And so it's, it, it's not so compartmentalized in a way. Even vision, as we look at each other, you know, maybe I remind you of somebody that you met before, your long lost uncle. And so you're having little images and, and memories of past visions that you've had, or you like my tie. You've seen one like this in a store when you were walking down the street two weeks ago. So even though it's a simple sensory input, it's relating to other things that your brain has in it. That's why when I think of, let's say, a farm, I might immediately jump in my mind to think about something like a field or a pasture, or maybe a cow, or maybe the farmer. And that's because in my brain I store information as it relates to the probability that things concur, that things arise in my brain in successive time. The brain is actually constructing not just isolated representations of little pieces of the behavior that you're getting better at, it's actually constructing the sequence. Tenet number four, initial changes are just temporary. If the brain judges the experience to be inherently fascinating or novel, or if the behavioral outcome is a good or bad one, then they become permanent. When something occurs that really engages our emotions, that really engages us powerfully, we know it's important, we never forget it, right? And it's because the brain basically is saying, save that one. The brain is deciding what to record. It's deciding what changes to enable to strengthen. It's important to understand that it's not just dramatic things that cause your brain to change its structure. Uh, and its function. It's things that you're doing all the time. Uh, if you are watching this television show, you're changing your brain to some degree. But if you do something over and over again and you increase it incrementally, that's how you get um, major brain change that's, that's more lasting. Tenet number five. Brain plasticity is a two-way street and we can either drive brain change positively or negatively. Overall, the discovery of brain plasticity is very uplifting. But our plasticity also gets us into all sorts of difficulties as well. There, there are a number of disorders we've now discovered that in fact uh, are explained in terms of plasticity. Some of the chronic pain syndromes are actually based on the plastic brain becoming very, very good at firing the pain signal. That's, that would be one example. Virtually every bad habit we ever develop is actually a product of our brain plasticity. Our brain just gets very, very good at the bad habit and it becomes very, very hard to shake. So once we discover that the brain is plastic, it means two things, that we have the power to change our brains much more than we ever believed. It's more malleable. But a malleable brain is also a vulnerable brain. And if you keep in mind that everything we do and everything we're bombarded with in a sensory way also is changing our brains, um, 
we realize that we're much more easily altered by the environment than we ever imagined. Tenant number six, memory is crucial for learning. The brain is continually setting models of where learning is heading. And it's also remembering from moment to moment how we're doing in the progression of developing our skill or our ability. But it's also always evaluating against the model, and the model is held in memory. So in other words, I have a notion in my memory about what I'm trying to do. I know I'm trying to hit that ball. I know what I want to do. I know right where I want to hit it. Now I hit it, and I evaluate what the outcome is. If I thought about the movements it took, if I thought about all of the information that I had to get back from my arm and my body and, and how I had to control all of these muscles in order to, get to do just that, I couldn't control that in a thousand years. But the brain has this magical way of doing it. It just says, all of those complex combinations of things, those 101 things that require just to do that, save them. Tenant number seven, motivation is a key factor in brain plasticity. When these plastic changes occur, the new networks are connected. And in some cases, a life can continue even after something as seemingly devastating as a stroke. I was in medical school in Mexico City. I got a call and they said, come get your father. He's had a stroke and he's in very bad shape. My father had drive. He was not going to sit still for it. And he trusted me and I said, we're going to do something about this. I don't know what, but we're going to do something about this. The only model for learning how to walk was the first model. Ch children, I said, this is what you did when you started to walk the first time. Let's see if you can do it the second time. And there was also a practical side. My father just hated being dependent. He could not tolerate being dependent. At first he was on his, his elbow, really, because he couldn't straighten his arm out properly. But uh, after a while, he was crawling on hands and knees. And he got to the point where he could crawl up the stairs. Little by little, things came back. The more he struggled with it, the more came back. Pedro Bacchirita was basically cured by his therapy with his son, George. He remarried returned to his role as a professor at the City College of New York, and enjoyed a very active life. During this time, his other son, Paul Bakirita, was making a name for himself as a leading neuroscientist. When Pedro died, Paul requested an autopsy. And a few days later, Paul was called into the pathologist's lab, and there, spread out before him on slides, uh, were little bits of his father's brain. Paul, Paul was revolted by this and, and, and numbed out, but the pathologist said, look at this. And what Paul realized was that the parts of the brain that had been destroyed and obliterated by the stroke were there to be seen. There had been massive damage. 97% of certain parts of the brain involved in movement had actually been destroyed. And a light bulb went off for Paul because he realized suddenly that what his father's brain had done in that work with George was reorganize itself so that parts that weren't originally involved in those uh, movements took over. And, and this was a great watershed for Paul because suddenly he realized that the, the brain, the brain of an older person could be fantastically plastic. Baki Rita had such remarkable success with his therapy because he put his focus not on the skill like walking, but how the skill was acquired the learning process. That is how changes take place in our brain, through new skill acquisition. But it has to be the right type of learning to direct positive plastic changes. The brain wants you to refine, work on refining your abilities that are slipping. It wants you to be engaged again, so that when you're listening to a conversation, you're really listening, not just sort of half listening. So that when you're out in the world, you're really paying attention and you're living out and you see the flower again, and you see the shine on it as the sun reflects on it. In a sense, the brain is asking you to be young again in your attitude. It's asking you to have your eyes sparkle again with life. It's asking you to take up new challenges. It's asking you to take life seriously again. It's asking you to be engaged with power and vigor and energy and intensity. So 
I think one of the deadliest things that happens in a modern life is that we imagine that the good life is a life that in a sense is the withdrawn and the controlled and the boring life of the mundane. All of those things that we're good at that pretty soon nobody else is that interested in knowing about because we reduce ourselves. We simplify. We become the older person that has relatively little to talk about and certainly relatively little new. And we seek comfort uh, as opposed to novelty, as opposed to a new perspective, as opposed to a new ability. If you want to improve your brain, there's four things you've got to do. The first thing is you need your heart to be in decent shape. Your heart supplies your brain with blood and oxygen, and it needs that to run. So cardiovascular exercise is actually important. Then the training has got to be incremental and start just below where you are. Then it's got to be taxing. It's got to be systematically improving and doing something that's a, it's, it's difficult for you to do, but you can still manage with a, a bit of a strain to do it. And it actually should be interesting. And the reason it should be interesting is because the chemistry involved in motivation. Neuroplasticity is in fact the brain's default position, that it can undergo changes in its structure and function based on you know, just everyday circumstances, whether it's you know, learning to play the piano to expand the region of the somatosensory and motor cortex that controls the fingers that you use on the keyboard, whether it's acting back on the emotion regions of the brain through mental training and meditation to dial up the activity that corresponds to a greater sense of well-being, of contentment. So the idea that neuroplasticity is some special or even aberrant thing that the brain does is completely incorrect. Neuroplasticity is something that can be tapped in ordinary life um, through just normal activities that you undergo throughout your day and through the thoughts that you think. We'll all hopefully live to a ripe old age, uh, but what will we be when that happens, right? I mean, it's not so much about getting old, it's about being a better older person. Right? I mean, we're all capable of being a better, more fascinating, more interested, and more competent older person. And that's what it's about. It's about living to the very end of life, just full of it. You've probably spent a long time on the downslide, neglecting your brain. But if you undertake a program of brain fitness, the payoffs can be enormous. It's all about giving your brain span the chance to eclipse your lifespan. As we get older, the decline of the machinery that controls our learning and memory also controls our verve, our brightness, our confidence, our spark. Be encouraged to know that if you exercise your very plastic brain in the right ways, you'll be surprised how much the joy, the spirit, the dancing of body and mind will return. It's far beyond remembering the odd face or word. It's about retaining your vitality, your savoir-faire, your independence, and yourself.